Okay, here's a problem that has lots of parts to it, so let's read carefully. For each of the following functions, use the limit definition of the derivative to compute the value of f prime at a using three different approaches. You're going to use algebraic approach first to compute the limit exactly, then test your result using numerical evidence with the small values of h, and finally plot the graph of y equals f of x near a f of a along with the appropriate tangent line to estimate the value of f prime of a visibly. Compare your findings among the three approaches. If you are unable to complete the algebraic approach, still work numerically and graphically. Okay, probably the numerical approach is what's going to cause the most consternation. Uh, most students can do well with the other ones. But let's just try the algebraic approach first. So I want to find the derivative of f of x at x equal a. So um, in a previous handout, I did something like these two guys right here. So I have f prime of a is equal to this guy and f prime of x is equal to this guy. Now I tend to always use the derivative function as opposed to putting in a particular number here. And the algebra will be a little bit better to see if I just use this formula. So I'm going to find the derivative function first and then plug in one. Okay. So let's use that. That means that to find the derivative function, I have to say that f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to zero, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. There's some interesting algebra here, so let's pay attention and, and uh, stop. If you have a question, kind of watch again what I did. So again, I need three pieces, f of x, f of x plus h, and h. H just as stays H, so that's settled. F of X is this guy, square root of X. And then F of X plus H, I have to replace X with X plus H. So it's going to be the square root of X plus H. So I'm going to substitute that in there. Limit as H goes to zero of square root of X plus H minus the square root of X all over H. So the problem comes here is now when I try to take this limit, I get something that's undefined, but there doesn't look like there's a whole lot of algebra to do to get this into a state where I can plug in zero for H and get something defined. So I'm going to show you a trick, not necessarily a trick, but a, a, a process that's just isn't used a whole lot because we don't work with functions like this a whole lot. So, Let's just, let me just show you how it works. And then hopefully when you see it again next, it won't be such a pain in the neck to you. Okay. So again, I'm going to come over here and do some scratch work. So I don't have to do all my algebra inside here. I mean, you can if you want, but you don't have to. So my goal is to simplify square root of X plus H minus the square root of X all over H. The key here is using, you use the conjugate on the top and the bottom of the numerator. So conjugate, what does that mean? So if I think about the conjugate, let me write about that over here. The conjugate is a special binomial that when you multiply it to another binomial, something fun happens. So you have to think about something like a plus b and a minus b. Those are conjugates, why? When I multiply these out, so I have a squared minus ab plus ab minus b squared, notice the middle terms go away and I'm left with a squared minus b squared. The conjugate of a binomial will always create this process to which the middle terms disappear. Now, oft times, um, the conjugate always has the second guy negative in our case, it's, it doesn't matter which one we make negative, but always make the second guy the negative of what he was originally. So if it was originally plus, now it's minus. If it's really minus, now it's plus in order for this middle behavior to happen. Now, why does it work with square roots? Well, if A and B are both square roots, notice what I do. I have a square root squared, gets rid of the radical. Square root squared gets rid of the radical. This is the secret to the problem conjugate. 
So let's use it. So if I'm looking at that term right there, I, the conjugate is going to be the exact same thing except for with the plus sign in the middle. Square root of x plus h minus the square root of x, but instead of minus, it's gotta be the opposite sign in order for the conjugate to happen. If I do it on the top, I have to multiply by the same value on the bottom in order to keep the expression the same value. So this is just a big old one right here. So let's do the algebra to multiply. So this guy times this guy, square root of x plus h squared, minus x plus h times x, plus x plus h times square root of x, and those two will cancel. And then I'll just be left with minus square root of x squared. And in the bottom, I'm just gonna kind of put those things right next to each other. Don't multiply it out, it just makes it messy. It's kind of crammed in there. That's x plus h. Plus square root of x. Hopefully you can read that, sorry. Now the numerator will become x plus h, because if I square a square root, I just get the inside, minus square root of x squared is x divided by h times the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. In the numerator, the x's go away and I'm left with just h. So that'll be h divided by h square root of x plus h plus square root of x and those h's go. So my last algebra statement is one divided by square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. Again, in all that algebra, the secret is this step, the conjugate. Conjugate. Right there. When you're working with radicals, when you're working with complex numbers, the conjugate is a little secret weapon that you have that helps you through a lot of algebraic stuff. Again, if I went too fast between here and here, just write this top line down, multiply together these two binomials step by step like we did here, and convince yourself that what I did is right, okay? So now I have this result down here, and that's what I'm gonna put up in my limit in my definition up here. So this is gonna equal, limit as h goes to zero, of one over square root of x plus h, plus the square root of x. If I now put zero in for h, notice that nothing is undefined then, and I'm left with one over the square root of x plus the square root of x. So if I combine those at the bottom, it's not x, it's two square root of x. So I have one square root of x here and one square root of x here. I'm adding them together and I get one over two square root of x. That's my derivative at any value of x. I'm going to say that again. If I let h go to zero, this guy becomes just a square root of x. That's a square root of x. And I have two of them that I'm adding up. So that's going to be one over two square root of x is my derivative. Now let's calculate f prime at one, which is what the question is asking you to do. So that should be one over two times square root of one, which is one over two. So f prime of one is one over two, one half. Slope of the tangent line at one is one half. Now the second part says we're supposed to use um, a sufficiently small value of h. Test result numeric with numerical evidence. Well, what I say numerical evidence is, is I'm going to use my limit definition to approximate f prime of one to approximate f prime of one using this guy, f of one plus h minus f of one over h, with h being really small or fairly small, h equals 0 0.001, and I'm just gonna plug it in there. So that's gonna be f of one plus 0 0.001 minus f of one all over h. That's a good approximate for the derivative at one for small values of h. 
So this is going to be the square root of 1.001 minus the square root of 1 over 0 0.001. So I do the numerator, square root of 1.001, let me clear this out, second square root of 1.001 minus, so even though I know what the square root of 1 is, I'm still going to type it in there so it looks the same. So this is scientific notate, notation, 4.999. 9987 times 10 to the negative 4. So that number is, and the numerator is going to be 0 0.499. Oh, that's not right. Move the decimal four places. 0 0.1234998 or 88 divided by 0 0.001. divided by 0 0.001. What do I get? Four, uh, 0 0.49988. 0 0.49988, which to me is pretty close to 1 half, which I got my f prime of 1 is about 1 half here, based on that method. And then f prime of 1 is 1 half up here. Pretty close. I mean, luckily, I'm not getting 17 down here and 1 half up here. They should be close. Now, the last method, then, is just to estimate the slope of the tangent line at this graph. So let me see. Do I have a straight edge in here? I do. There's my straight edge. And I think I'm going to use a pencil. Let's see if I got a pencil. Okay. So I'm going to come to my picture, and I'm going to draw a tangent line here. This is the square root of x, and here's x equal 1. It's really hard to see, but it is there. That's a 1. So my tangent line is going to be about right there. So I'm doing this in pencil, so if I mess up bad, I can just adjust it a little bit. But I adjust my ruler so it looks tangent. So there's an equal amount of the graph touching on both sides of the ruler. Okay, So you can see here that the ruler is touching about that far, and the ruler is touching about that far. So that would be a reasonable tangent line approximation right there. So I'm going to draw it in there. Now we have to see what the slope of that line is. Now each of these boxes is 1. So let's see if I, oh that turns out nice. Look at that. It goes right through pretty close to that corner. So up 1, so the rise is 1 and the run is 2. So it looks like my approximation for my slope is about one half. So that means I can approximate and say that my derivative at x equal one is about one half. So you can see it checks one half, close to one half, or very close, and then one half. Good. There's a lot of work on this page. Um, I'm going to scan this in so that you can see it. At least my class will be able to see it. And uh, hopefully you'll have your questions answered.